green thing. Um, I can do that. There. Yeah, copy. So uh, I'm Lou Libby. I'm a uh, pulmonary and critical care and sleep physician. Um, I'm retired. You can see that there uh, in the little uh, uh, under my name. I retired a little more than a year ago um, after 37 years in Portland in practice at the Oregon Clinic um, and Providence Portland Medical Center at the ALS Clinic. Um, so I had about 37 years of uh, oh, clinical experience after training, 45 with training. Um, and, uh, that too. Uh, there's, there's sort of an echo or other noise coming on intermittently. If I stop, that's why. Um, but really, uh, ALS became a larger and larger part of my practice uh, as time went on. And uh, eventually I became a member of the board of the local ALS Association chapter of Oregon and Southwest Washington, and a uh, uh, member of the board of trustees of the National ALS Association. I chaired the Care Services Committee. I chair some other committees uh, nationally that have to do with ALS and breathing. So I've got a lot of background, but uh, none uh, active in the last year. So um, with that little background about me, how about we go to the first slide? Or do I get to advance them? Let's see. Oh, someone advanced them for me. I appreciate it. Well, um, as you all know, ALS can present in different ways. And about two thirds of the people when they first get ALS, the first thing they notice is weakness in their hands or their legs. Um, and that's called uh, extremity onset or peripheral onset. And that's again, about two thirds of people. About one third of people get what's called bulbar onset. And bulbar onset refers to the bulb of the brain, which controls swallowing and voice and the sort of everything in the throat area. Um, and it looks like a little bulb if you look at that section of the brain. So they called it bulbar. So, and that's about a third of people. So one third of people, the first thing they notice is bulbar. Two thirds, the first thing they notice is, is uh, extremity weakness. About 1%, one out of 100, the first thing they notice is breathing problems. And that's what I'm uh, an expert at and have my most experience at. But realize everyone eventually gets everyone, everything. Uh, everyone gets extremity weakness. Everyone gets bulbar involvement. And everyone gets breathing problems. It may be weird in terms of the timing. I've seen patients who couldn't breathe at all but could still walk. I've had plenty of, plenty of patients who are wheelchair bound and can breathe fine. So it really is, it's really unpredictable, but over time, everyone will get everything, meaning all three aspects. This slide here uh, shows you the breathing muscles, at least the most important ones. And by far the most important one is this thing called the diaphragm. I don't know if you can see my little air, my arrow or not. Amber, can you see that when I'm going over the diaphragm? <laughs> My pointer? No, no, we can't. No problem. Well, the diaphragm is a big semicircular muscle at the bottom of the rib cage, uh, separating the uh, inside of the chest. You're circling it just fine now. Um, the inside of the chest from the abdominal cavity. And it is a muscle that when it activates, it goes from semicircular like this to flat like that, if you look at my face on the side there. Um, and by doing that, it expands the inside of the chest cavity and air rushes in. That's how we breathe in. It gets some help from those <laughs> external intercostals. Those are muscles in between the ribs and from those other muscles called the scalenes and sternocleidomastoid. But most of it is done uh, most of it's done with the diaphragm. So that's the main muscle of inspiration, breathing in. The muscles of expiration are a little more complex, but the main ones are the muscles in your belly, um, the ones that people do sit-ups for and crunches and all that sort of thing. It pushes hard and it pushes everything up through the abdomen and compresses the lungs so air comes out. But we don't really have to do that unless we're gonna cough or sneeze. Normal breathing out, the lungs like to collapse. If you breathe in and just relax, air comes out. You don't have to think about it or force it out. There are some other muscles that help out in expiration, the other intercostals um, and some others, but the main other muscles that are important for expiration are the throat muscles, the ones that are affected by bulbar. Um, and that's because to, to cough or sneeze, you have to take a deep breath in, then you have to close your voice box up in your neck. Um, that takes muscles. And then you force air out very 
forcibly and suddenly, once you get that force up, you open the voice box and air comes out with any mucus or anything that's coming with it. So those are the three groups of muscles that can be affected by ALS. Uh, next slide, please. Great. So when we think about the respiratory effects of ALS, it all has to do with those three groups of muscles. There's some inner, inner, um, interconnectedness of those muscles, the way they work, but inspiratory muscle weakness or fatigue, um, and that's mainly the diaphragm. It, if you aren't breathing deep enough, eventually the carbon dioxide in the blood goes up and that leads to respiratory failure and areas of the collapse that aren't able to be expanded and they get stiff and are prone to pneumonia. Um, but that's, and, and people get short of breath, as you'll see in another slide in terms of symptoms. The expiratory muscles, the main thing that happens if they get weak is an inadequate cough. And it's obviously worse if you have bulbar weakness as well. And if you have bulbar muscle weakness, the main issue is not coughing well, but also aspiration. Aspiration means things going down the wrong pipe. Things like saliva, bacteria, mucus from the mouth, or even stomach acid in some people. Next slide, please. So here's some signs and symptoms of uh, um, inspiratory muscle fatigue. When the diaphragm gets weak, people will breathe faster and more shallow. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, a physician or a nurse in the respiratory, um, in the ALS clinic may be counting your breathing at some time. You know, they're gonna count your pulse, although they now do that with a little machine, but uh, they may watch you breathe for and see if your respiratory rate is 10 or 12 or 14 or maybe 20 or 24. 20 or 24 when sitting and relaxing is not normal. So that's a sign of it. Another is what we call asynchronous or paradoxical chest and abdominal movement. When we breathe in effectively, our chest goes out and our belly goes out. Um, it may not be pretty, but that's the way things work best. But if they both work together in tandem, if the muscles get weak, they'll go like this. One will go in and one will get out, go out. The most obvious sign frequently is accessory muscle use, uh, muscles in your neck. Um, we'll go like this. You can see my shoulders going up and down, and that's trying to get air in without using the diaphragm. And eventually, as the carbon dioxide level goes up, and remember, we breathe in oxygen, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a, um, a byproduct of metabolism, of using all the sugar and proteins and everything else that we use to, to keep going. But if the CO2 level goes up, people get insomnia, they get lethargic, they have morning headaches, they can get confused. Uh, those are pretty late signs. Uh, so you don't want to get to that point um, uh, before you do something about your breathing muscles. Uh, next slide, please. So in the ALS clinic, um, in, in pretty much any ALS clinic, they'll do some pretty standard tests. One's called the forced vital capacity, or FVC for short. They might do it, they almost always do it sitting, but sometimes they'll do it lying down. And uh, the forced vital capacity is that test that is done when the respiratory therapist will tell you, put a mouthpiece in your mouth, sometimes a mask, but usually a mouthpiece. They'll ask you to take a breathe normal and then take a real deep breath in as high as you can. And then they yell and scream at you. They go, blow, 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 blow. And they keep yelling at you to keep blowing, even though there's nothing more to blow. They want to get everything possible out of your lungs. So that's the forced vital capacity. And that's sort of a overall measure of your breathing capacity. Um, a more specific one for inspiratory muscles and expiratory muscles is a little valve you suck in on or blow out it against. And that's called maximal inspiratory and maximal expiratory pressure. And the maximal inspiratory looks mainly at the diaphragm and the maximal expiratory mainly looks at the mm -hmm. abdominal muscles. There's another little device called a peak cough flow. And that sort of measures your ability to cough, but that's also your expiratory muscles, but also how well your voice box works. And then in, in <laughs> rare cases, most people don't knew, know, need this. Uh, we'll do an arterial blood gas where we stick a needle into the artery. Almost every time you have blood drawn, it's in a vein. Those are the ones you can see on the surface and they're easy to get the, uh, the uh, arterial blood that's coming away from the heart and lungs out to the tissues is you you can you can feel it in your wrist. It's the same place people get the pulse, but you got to go a little deeper to get into that vessel. So it's not done commonly. So that's uh, that's most of my uh, written presentation. Now I got a lot of pictures to show you. That's a lot more fun. Next slide, please. 
So these are the, uh, the, the testing devices. The, the one on the left there with a little uh, paper coming out of it and the mouthpiece is a spirometer. And that's the one that we do the forced vital capacity. Um, and you take that little uh, device um, with the white mouthpiece and you take, take a deep breath and blow out as hard as you can, or sometimes they ask you to breathe in first. And it produces the numbers that tell us how much air you can blow out. And normal is between 80 and 100%, and it's standardized for your age, your sex, and your height. Um, not for weight, but uh, age, set, sex, and height. And generally, yeah. in adults, to ignore kids, but in adults, younger, taller men have uh, much bigger lungs and a higher force vital capacity than short, old women. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's just the fact of life. Uh, as we grow older, our vital capacity or our breathing capacity uh, drops, not to the point that if you have healthy lungs and healthy muscles, it's a problem. You can live well into your hundreds with the, the lungs you have. But but if you have uh, problems with the lungs, whether it's the muscles or from smoking or heart failure or asthma, whatever, then you will have uh, uh, a smaller vital capacity, either temporarily or permanently. So that's the machine they use to measure the vital capacity. The machine on the right with the uh, green 20 to 30, yep, you're circling it correctly, is a um, inspiratory or expiratory force measure. And all you do is you, uh, there's a little mouthpiece that goes with that. You suck and that little dial will show you a number. And normal on that's about minus 60 or 70. Um, this one only goes up to 40, it looks like, but the... Uh, um, uh, others go up much higher, but for adults, minus 60 or 70 is normal inspiratory pressure. <clears throat> and then the last thing down at the bottom is a, um, uh, it's actually a peak flow meter. If you ever had asthma, they might have given you one of these, um, but it's also used for cough. And you can see the numbers on, on there. They go anywhere from 100 up to 700. And uh, normal for an adult Male uh, is is 500 and better, and for a female is 400 and better. Roughly, there's some normal tables for that, and again, it varies with uh, various things. But if you're under 300, you've got a, a weak cough, and probably under 250 for a woman, and you might need help with your cough. And certainly, under 200 is really a bad cough, and you need something to help your cough. So th those are some of the tools we use in the. Uh, in the ALS clinic to measure your breathing um, accurately. Next slide, please. So once we've done all that stuff, we come up with a plan and I'll go through what the plan entails. The first thing almost everyone gets is a something that looks like this. It's <laughs> called an Ambu bag. That's the big bag, um, uh, not the mask, but the big bag. And Ambu stands for Anesthesia Manual Breathing Unit. And an anesthesiologist might use that to breathe for you as they put you to sleep. And they, you may remember having a little mask put over your, your face and then they begin squeezing a bag and they're breathing for you. And that's great for an anesthesiologist, but for you, what this does is you can do what we call breath stacking, either with a mask, and you might need someone else to hold that for you, a mask or a mouthpiece. Um, you can squeeze the bag and get a partial breath. And then before you let any out, you breathe it again. And after three or four, you'll ex totally expand your lungs. And that helps keep them sort of exercised and clean because if you begin to have a little breathing weakness, you'll never fully expand the lungs. And if you don't expand it, you sort of lose it. It becomes scarred and it prone to pneumonia, things like that. So we generally recommend that you breath stack to a full, full inspiration as, as much as you can take in. Um, three to five big times, meaning it might take three or four squeezes, but do that three to five times twice a day to fully expand your lungs. So, and, and the nice thing is the cost of this thing is almost nothing. I think they're given out in most ALS clinics. If not, uh, you can get them from uh, Amazon or durable medical equipment companies for 15 to $30. So they're not expensive. Um, and uh, no, no side effects. So we get we use them quite freely. Next, please. Mm -hmm. The next issue that we usually deal with is is seeing signs of respiratory insufficiency, <laughs> meaning your your breathing capacity is lower than we would like. And I won't go through all the numbers, but that's determined uh, 
by those breathing tests we've done. And we can, we can support your breathing in one of two ways. Uh, one is not used very often, probably three to 5% of all patients. It's called invasive, meaning something goes into your body, usually through what's called a tracheostomy, a, hall, a small surgical placed tube into your neck, into the windpipe or the trachea, right at the base of the neck where I'm showing it to you on my picture. Um, uh, and that's one way to breathe for people, but it's drastic. Um, so most people don't want it or get to that. Another way to do it's called non-invasive, meaning there's nothing invading the body. Non-invasive mechanical ventilation. It's got lots of advantages. You maintain your speech and swallowing. It's comfortable. You can use it intermittently. Um, it's inexpensive, easy to manage uh, compared to tracheostomy. And it can be used either with a nose piece or a mouth or a total mouth piece, a total face mask. I'll show you some of those. And it's got lots of names. Um, BiPAP, uh, non-invasive mechanical ventilation, AVAPS, and uh, it can be done in different ways. But let's go to the next slide and I'll show you some of that equipment. So these are three uh, um, uh, ventilators, basically. You heard a lot about ventilators in the COVID era. And all three of these um, are ventilators. The, the two on the side are considered non-invasive only. They could not be used in an intensive care unit. They could not be used with a tracheostomy, but they can be used with the masks. And down the bottom, the woman's wearing a nice nasal mask um, that has some advantages and some disadvantages. And the man is wearing what's called a full face mask. Um, that uh, covers the nose and the mouth um, and uh, has some advantages and disadvantages. The machines at the top, the ones on the, the left and the right are, um, uh, one of them is called an IVAPS machine. That's the one um, above the woman. And the one on the right above the man is called an AVAPS machine. And what those stand for is uh, VAPS, V-A-P-S stands for Volume Assured Pressure Support meaning they make sure you get the right size breath by pushing air in. Um, one of them is called uh, AVAPS. I believe that stands for automatic. And one is called IVAPS because they couldn't use AVAPS because it was a registered tra trademark. So they came up with their own thing. IVAPS stands for intelligent volume uh, uh, assured pressure support. And then the, the machine, and those are the most commonly used with ALS patients, certainly early on. Um, and they're, they're quite smart machines and they adapt to you and uh, uh, they're quite adjustable. Uh, people have, uh, it takes some time to get used to them, but they blow air in uh, on the, some parameters set by the physician, but are adjustable by your respiratory therapist. The person who brings it out to you or the company that supplies it can make some adjustments to make it comfortable or more comfortable or more effective uh, based on some parameters given to them by the physician. Um, the machine in the middle is called a Trilogy, and that's a ventilator that could be used in the intensive care unit or with COVID patients. Um, and another company makes one that's called Astral. Um, and these are machines that uh, can, can work with a tracheostomy or, uh, or without, with a, ma a mask. Um, the, the machine in the middle is much, much more expensive. Its main advantage is twofold. It can be used with a tracheostomy. It can be used in an unusual uh, situation where people uh, use, a, use a straw to take a, a breath. They sip on a straw and then uh, that straw delivers a full breath to them. It's called sip and puff. And it's a minority of ALS patients who can do it, but it can be done with a machine in the middle or the equivalent by another company, but not by the machines on the side. Um, and that's a nice alternative for people who uh, have good bulbar function because it requires a good coordination in your mouth and throat um, and need breathing assistance during the day and don't want to put a mask on that might interfere with, with, uh, with uh, communication, for example, especially that one on the guy. So those are the machines uh, that, that, that can breathe for you. And let me show you just a little data about why we are big believers in them. Next slide, please. So this is a uh, really an older study, but the, probably the first study that showed that BiPAP, and BiPAP is uh, a more generic name for AVAPS and uh, IVAPS, um, these machines I just showed you, uh, where you can use a mask. Uh, BiPAP stands for bi-level positive airway pressure. 
But regardless, so the, the new machines are just smarter. They have a little microcomputer in them. So uh, this shows survival over months uh, after starting a BiPAP machine in patients who didn't use it at all, no BiPAP, patients who used it less than four hours a day and those who used it more than four hours a day. And uh, more than four hours usually was when people slept. They put it on when they went to bed and got up the next morning, six, seven, eight hours later um, and uh, had used it a good amount of time. Excuse me. Uh, so uh, you and these patients were started pretty late in the course of their disease. Um, this is because it hadn't been studied very much at that point. But you can see the ones who were able to use it more than four hours lived on average 14 months versus those who didn't use it at all at four months and those who used it but not very much got about six months. So we really encourage people to use it at least four hours a night or four hours a day and if possible up to six or eight or if they need it more that's fine too. And many patients eventually say I'm much more comfortable wearing this mask and many of you may have seen other ALS patients who wear the mask all day long. They're just much more comfortable with their breathing if they do that or they use it 20 hours a day something like that. So that's that's old science, as you can see, 1999 was in, when that was reported, but it's been reconfirmed many times in many different ways. Next slide, please. Uh, the next thing you might need is called a cough assist machine. Um, and you've all probably heard of the Heimlich maneuver in the past, and that's one way to assist someone with a cough but it's not a very pleasant way to do it. And it's usually only used in dire emergencies, like when someone swallows a hunk of steak down the wrong pipe, as you can see on the right side here with the two men helping, the one man helping the other who looks pretty miserable. But on the left is what we call a mechanical cough assist machine. And it's so, you know, the size of it's it's pretty small. It might be the size, it's a little different shape, but sort of shoebox size. Uh, in that range, uh, you can tell the size of it from, compared to his the, the man's arms and head. Um, and it imitates a cough. It does not cough for you, but what it does is it blows a large breath into you, and then suddenly that's pushing air into you. Suddenly it switches to sucking air out of you. So it's imitating a cough. It doesn't do exactly what a cough does, but it frequently is effective enough to get mucus that's stuck down in the windpipe up into the throat and you can spit it out or suction it out from there. And, and remember, we all make mucus in our lungs every day. You don't think about it, but most of us, when we get up in the morning, again, you don't think about this either, but you'll clear your throat. We just call it clear the throat <laughs> like that. And a little mucus comes up to the back of the mouth and most of us, we swallow it and don't think twice about it. You don't even think about it. Um, uh, but if you have ALS and a weak cough, you can't do that. And if it stays down there, eventually it'll cause problems, including pneumonia, including ineffective breathing because it's blocking bronchial tubes. So it's a good thing to get it out. And we recommend uh, using this twice a day. And in actuality, if you do this twice a day, you're doing breath stacking twice, twice a day as well because it's blowing air in to the point where your lungs are highly expanded. And it can be set up just to do breath stacking, just to do cough assist or do both. So it's, it's a great little machine. But unlike that um, breath stacking AMBU bag I showed you, which is either free or 15 or $30, this is on the order of $5,000. So we don't give them out willy nilly right off the bat to everybody. Um, okay, next slide, and we're almost done, I think. Aha, the famous suction machine. This is a suction machine, um, and it's sort of like the suction machine a dentist might use in the office when he's clearing mucus out of your mouth um, or, or saliva because he's got all those cotton things in there and he doesn't want you to swallow while he's working on your teeth. So this is basically that. It's a um, uh, relatively inexpensive piece of equipment at 300 to 500 for most of them, and it comes with a flexible tubing uh, that you can uh, put in your mouth. You can even hook it up to a special toothbrush called a uh, uh, suction toothbrush. So while you're brushing your teeth, you can suck out the mucus um, uh, and, and water and everything else. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a nice machine to have. So that's a little background on the breathing muscles, on the way we test the breathing muscles, and some of the interventions we use to help people who have breathing muscle weakness. Unfortunately, there's nothing I told you that stops the muscles from getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And eventually, 
people uh, will decide that uh, they want comfort at the end of life or they want a tracheostomy, an ongoing 24-hour day support, which is, which is a challenge to say the least. So I'll stop there. We can go to the next slide. And I think it's the last slide. Yeah, I'm glad to take any questions. Um, we can, uh, if you have questions specifically about a slide, we can go back to them. Um, or if it's not about the slide, we can probably take the slides down and pop them up later if we need to, whatever people want to do. Yeah, feel free and uh, either unmute yourself or go to the chat. I don't see any questions quite. Let's see. Ah, 